Hi, Timberline community. Pastor Brent here uh, again with Dr. Doug Groteis. <clears throat> this is part two of a conversation. If you missed the first one, I would really encourage you to go back, listen, listen to that. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Doug Groteis is professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary, prolific, prolific author, um, speaker. Uh, he's, he's been up to CSU campus before we brought him up for some campus outreach that we've done, some conferences, seminars at, at, at Timberline. So he's not a complete stranger to us. Um, I studied under Dr. Groteis about 20 years ago down at Denver Seminary. And uh, really, really appreciative for the impact that he's made in uh, philosophy and apologetics. So uh, Dr. Groteis, thank you so much for being here with us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, what I thought I, I would like you to address, if you would, the problem of evil. We we brought that up a little bit in our last conversation. Um, how would you, or how would someone? There's maybe different ways that that people could um, put forth what the problem is. But what's the most simple way that you could put forth the objection to God uh, in light of evil? Well, it's a perennial question can we believe in a being who is all good and all powerful and there'd be so much evil in the world. And now of course, with this pandemic, many people are saying, Lord, how can you allow this? Or uh, couldn't you have done a better job of running the world than this? And essentially it has to do with understanding how a God of immeasurable power and perfect goodness would create and sustain and work in a universe that is as flawed as this one is and it's a big big topic but i want to point out a couple of things one is, is that uh, the issue of evil and meaning in life is not unique to christianity every religion and every worldview worth its salt has to give some account for the existence and meaning of evil in relation to what is good and the essential christian answer is that uh, god has reasons for allowing evil that go beyond what we can understand. I think a classic text on this would be in Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph says to his brothers who had betrayed him, sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So if God can use people's bad intentions or even use natural disasters for the good, why should we believe in God in the first place, basically. So you can say, sure, if there's an all good, all powerful being, he could have plans that we don't understand. But that's where you go for apologetics and you say, we have reasons independent of plagues and sins to believe there is a designer creator God. Uh, we have good reason to think the universe began a finite time ago, was created out of nothing. Science confirms this. Big Bang cosmology, we find all kinds of aspects of life that are fine-tuned to allow for life. They couldn't be here just by chance. So we have this basis of what's called natural theology, which I develop in my book, uh, Christian Apologetics, pretty thoroughly, that there is a creator designer God. And then we go to history and we look at scripture. We can start with the New Testament and we find out the New Testament is textually reliable, it's based on legitimate historical insights, and we can develop that argument. And who, of course, is the figure that dominates the New Testament and the whole Bible? Well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And who was he? He was a man who claimed the authority to forgive sins. He's a man who worked wonders, who taught wisdom, and who died forgiving his enemies. A man who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the birthright of the church is that this man who died to bring us to God rose from the dead. And so the early church preaches the resurrection of Jesus, a new message the world had never heard. Now Jesus fulfilled the Hebrew scriptures, but he did what no one else had ever done. He was God incarnate and he died for the sins of the world and he rose again in victory to give new life to the world. So what I'm saying here so shortly, so briefly, is that 
we have reason to believe there is a designer creator God, and this God has appeared on the human scene in Jesus Christ. We have historical evidence for that. And if that's true, then God is concerned about the human condition. In one sense, the worst thing that ever happened, the crucifixion of Jesus, because he was an innocent and righteous man, was the way that God redeems the world because Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and death could not hold him. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul actually mocks death. He says, uh, death, where is your victory? Christ is the victor. So our labor, therefore, is not in vain, because Christ has risen from the dead. So in light of that, when I face various evils like a pandemic or my first wife's tragic death from dementia, I say, Lord, I don't understand the details of what you're working out here. I can't as a finite being, as a limited being. But since you have revealed yourself in the creation, you're the creator, you're the designer, and since you visited this planet decisively through the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, then because of that framework of knowledge, I can trust you and I can find meaning in the midst of the various challenges and the various suffering we have to go through on this earth. So we don't have to hold to just fideism. That is the idea of just, just have faith without reason, without any evidence. By no means. No, there's a good reason to believe that Christianity is true and that it's meaningful to the whole of life, certainly. And as we so look at... Um, Go ahead. I was just going to say, so how would, you, you mentioned Christians aren't the only ones who have to give an answer for this objection or this concern. Um, every single one of us, even on an existential level, feels that things are out of joint. Things shouldn't be this way. Things are not the way they ought to be. Um, Christians aren't the only ones who have to answer how do we make sense of this? How do we find meaning? Just briefly, as you think about some of the other major worldviews, atheism and maybe a few more, do they give answers to the problem of evil? Well, every worldview has to account for suffering and evil and ask, can we find meaning in the midst of it? And let me give a response that has become more popular again recently, and that's existentialism. I'm thinking of atheistic existentialism like the teachings of Jean-Paul Sartre. They would say, no, there is no God. Therefore, there's no meaning of life. There's no direction to the universe. We're simply here, but we're free. So we can choose our destiny within a certain framework or within certain limitations. And that's where the meaning is. I create the meaning. I legitimize and authenticate myself through my owning up to my own responsibility and freedom. But the basic problem with that is that if the whole is meaningless and the universe is just there, as Bertrand Russell put it, then if the whole has no meaning, then the part has no meaning. So you may find something significant, but then you die, and then all that supposed meaning just dies with you. And if the universe is uncaring, uh, Richard Dawkins, the atheist biologist, said the universe shows us nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, then you're just a little smudge on the face of the universe, and it's all ultimately meaningless. So uh, actually any form of atheism is inadequate to face evil and suffering. It gives no meaning and no hope and no significance, and moreover, it's refuted by science and by good philosophy. There is a God. And from a biblical viewpoint, we don't have to know why certain kind of suffering kinds of suffering happen, but we can know that God is, as I mentioned in an earlier talk for you, God is here, God is knowledgeable, God is in control, God is guiding. We can know that, and then within that framework of knowledge, we have a lot of things we don't understand. But in any situation, you can find meaning through relying on God and trying to do the most loving thing moment by moment however bad the situation is. And we can know that God knows. We can know God is with us. Uh, we can know that this is not the end of the story. 
Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The final chapter has not yet been written. Actually, it's been written, but it hasn't played out yet. So we can have hope. And it's not just a blind leap of faith into nothing. It's a hope based on uh, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, who will come again. So, so atheism is really kind of a non-answer, in a sense, with the issue of finding meaning in the midst of suffering. What about um, Eastern worldviews? Someone who uh, maybe their background would be um, Hindu or Buddhist or some kind of more of an Eastern worldview perspective. What, what sort of answer is given? Well, most Eastern religion, that is Hinduism and Buddhism, do not teach that there's a personal God. That is, uh, God is a uh, an impersonal being of some kind, a force, a principle, something like that. And in what we sometimes call New Age circles, the idea is that God is a higher form of consciousness, something to that effect, some kind of power you could feel, but not a person who you could know or who would create the world or redeem the world, anything like that. So uh, some of these Eastern teachings say that evil, in fact, is an illusion that if we had a higher state of consciousness that we achieved through meditation or yoga, we'd realize that suffering and injustice are not finally real, that they are illusions. Uh, we can attain to this unity consciousness, this idea that all is one and all is divine and we are divine. I wrote a lot about that uh, many years ago in my books on the New Age Movement. And that is a terrible response because of a number of things. One, we have good reason to believe there is a personal, moral creator and sustainer of the universe. There's no reason to think that God is somehow beyond personality. It's just a mere force or principle. Then also, we know in our guts that evil exists. We know that what happened at Columbine 20 years ago was evil. We know that rape is evil, period. So if your worldview, worldview says that's not really evil, it's just an illusion because you have a lower level of consciousness, that's a good reason to just reject that entire viewpoint right there. Because the Christian worldview has to deal with the amount of evil in the world in light of God's omnipotence and total goodness. And that is an issue. It's a problem. But we admit that there is evil in the world, that sin entered the world. We're told about that in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, how that happened. But God came to bear the penalty, to pay the penalty for our sin through Christ. And the kingdom of God is let loose in the world, and it will not be stopped. So the biblical view is really kind of an ongoing drama where Christ has come, and he has laid out the terms of victory and engaging the world and includes suffering. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. But that suffering has meaning and evil is real. God came to deal with evil and he will continue to work out his plan through history until eventually the universe is purged and judged and renewed. And we're told of how that plays out in many passages in scripture, but I often go to Revelation 21 and 22 about the new heavens and the new earth where there is no curse and no tears and no lament because God has brought about his kingdom in its fullness. Eastern religions have no concept of uh, incarnation, kingdom of God, fulfillment of God's vision, God's mission. It's all about somehow leaving this world of sorrow behind. For Buddhism, it's entering nirvana. Uh, for Hinduism, it's finding a place beyond the dualities and beyond the desires of this world. But Christianity claims the universe will be, re will be judged, purged, and redeemed. The universe was a good idea. You don't have to leave it behind through spiritual enlightenment, which is really what Hinduism and Buddhism teach. And Taoism as well, really. One more, if you could address, because um, you've addressed atheism, you've addressed pantheism, Eastern pantheism. 
um, say one of the monotheistic faiths, um, Islam, <clears throat> it has a personal God. Right. Does, does, is it merely having a personal God that can solve this issue of meaning the problem of evil? Well, that's necessary. And uh, Islam is monotheistic. It teaches there is one God who created the world, who sends prophets, and who will be the final judge of the world. But unlike Christianity, which is really the fulfillment of Judaism, Islam is not the fulfillment of Christianity. It's actually a negation of Christianity, even though it claims to be the last and final revelation of Allah, the one true God. So the God of Islam is not the same God as the God of the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. Allah is not a God who comes to us in Christ. He is utterly transcendent, utterly removed from us. There's no gospel. There's no radical good news in Islam. Uh, the message of Islam is basically obey Allah and hope that you do enough good works to merit paradise. And the gospel message is you cannot merit paradise. Rather, the one with merit is Christ, and he offers salvation through his life, death, and resurrection, and we receive that as a gift. That's grace. That's good news. And then having been born again, because we've taken Christ at his word, we produce good works, but those good works show that we're redeemed. They don't somehow contribute to our redemption. So the God of Islam is, yes, you might say a personal God, a creator who sends prophets and so on, but Islam ends up denying the Trinity, denying the incarnation, and the incarnation, the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, John 1, is the ultimate key for understanding everything and for finding truth and meaning in suffering. Uh, because Jesus left heaven to come to earth. It's called his humiliation. You see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and so many passages, John 1. And he was a man born to die. He said the Son of Man must be betrayed and killed, and on the third day he'll rise again from the dead. So as C.S. Lewis said, earth is the visited planet. God cares enough about our suffering, our struggle, our unfulfilled hopes to raise up a people, the Jews, who would be the vehicle in the sense through which the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would come and would be God himself. Jesus even accepted worship when he was doing his earthly ministry. And you just have nothing like that in Islam. So Islam, sadly, is really a denial of the gospel, and it does not give us the conceptual or existential resources to handle suffering well. Islam really doesn't have a theology of suffering. So the incarnation does seem to be almost kind of a skeleton key <laughs> to, to yeah. getting at finding meaning amidst great suffering and evil. Absolutely. It? Yes. I, lo I love what you talk about. The, 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 you know, you uh, mentioned Revelation 21. And there is something, especially when going through suffering, uh, that's so hopeful. One of the things that I've really appreciated about um, N.T. Wright and some of his writings is um, reminding Christians that we're not Platonists, that, that we don't believe the end game is us leaving here, uh, you know, jettisoning uh, the earth as though it's like, you know, plan B or something. Yeah. And we live disembodied lives, but but that our hope is resurrection, new creation, physical bodies, a physical world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. God created the world and said it was very good. And of course, sin entered the world, but God never gave up on human beings or gave up on the idea of a universe. Uh, the universe will be restored and redeemed. And the incarnation teaches that God counts the world significant enough to come. The word became flesh and dwelt among us full of truth. And Jesus is raised from the dead in a physical body. And Paul tells us that we will be raised again from the dead in incorruptible bodies, 1 Corinthians 15. And then when you look at the world to come in various passage, but especially 
uh, in Revelation 21 and 22. It, it's a world of people interacting with each other and there being trees and communities and so on. It's not floating around on a cloud playing a harp, which I think sounds pretty cool, actually. But, you know, it's, <laughs> there are some images of that in the Revelation. But the final state is, uh, to go back to Jesus, is what he calls the restoration of all things. So God's not going to scrap the cosmos because sin entered it. He's going to redeem the cosmos. And he's promised us that in the end, there will be no effects of the curse. There'll be no disease. There'll be no death. There'll be no tears. And that's as certain as uh, the reality of Jesus and his resurrection. So we can put our hope fully in that reality. Not let, me ask you, let me ask you a, um, a language question. <clears throat> Oftentimes, um, you know, I see this in my pastoral work. Um, at funerals, um, heaven is mentioned, and by that they mean disembodied existence. Um, I would even suggest that the majority of funerals that, that I attend um, never mention resurrection, never mention new creation. Do you, when you speak of our hope, do, do you have, is there something wrong with talking about heaven as our hope? How, I, what are your thoughts on that? Well, scripture teaches that if we die before Christ comes again, that our souls will be directly with the Lord. Paul teaches that. So in that sense, there is a disembodied existence with the Lord in heaven, but that's not the final state. The final state is resurrected new heavens and new earth and in fact when my first wife rebecca was dying i would uh, typically comfort her by reading passages from revelation 21 and 22 and from uh, first corinthians 15 because uh, rebecca was a brilliant woman she wrote books she edited so much uh, she had a terrific sense of humor she used to sing uh, she was very beautiful, and I'd say, Becky, one day your brain will work perfectly, and we will we'll, we will sing and dance in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, I also told her that she, when she died, she would directly be with her Lord. But we kept both of those things in mind. There's not going to be some big gap. She's going to die and then cease to exist, and then she'll be resurrected who knows when. That's called soul sleep. That's not biblical. She'll be with the Lord. But the final state will be one of embodiment and flourishing and fellowship. <laughs> that's hopeful. <laughs> that's the kind of hope that's meaningful. Makes me happy just thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Grotheis, thanks for taking this time and uh, walking us through uh, what's a very real question to all of us. It hits us maybe more um, profoundly at moments than others. Uh, but I think all of us are maybe asking it a little bit more now in this season. So this is really, really helpful. Thanks for taking the time and again, pouring into the, into the lives of, of, of the uh, Timberline community. So thanks again. You're welcome. Happy to be here.